Thank you, Reverend Barnes. I really appreciate that. Great, great introduction. I want to thank Bishop also for allowing us to come and minister to you. I want to bring you greetings from Christian Stronghold Church, where Reverend Dr. Willie Richardson is our pastor and founder, also from Team PSCS Ministries. They send their love to you. So, as we explore today, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And our topic is in the beginning, One Blood, which is a celebration of the Hamite heritage for Black History Month. We're going to take it from Genesis to the present. Now, today, as Reverend Barnes has already said, we're going to take it from Genesis all the way up to the church fathers in the early times of the Christian church. Now, to be able to do that, we want to answer some serious questions, such as what is our real national biblical heritage? So we explore our glorious past and where you can find yourself as well as free yourself. Amen. So because find yourself free yourself is apologetic in nature, there are two scriptures that are going to drive our two-part series. First one is 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging him, giving him first place in your lives as Lord. Always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and confident assurance elicited by faith as within you. Yet, watch this now, do it with gentleness and respect. So we always want to be ready to give an answer, a biblical answer. And the second thing is 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not physical. They are weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction. Notice now, the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying sophisticated arguments. And every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. That's from the Amplified. Notice, we've got weapons. Notice, we are at war. Notice, our weapons are divinely powerful and are not of flesh and blood. We don't run around with AK-47s and Glocks. But we are destroying, and there are a lot of sophisticated arguments out there. And everything that exalts itself and is proud in its nature, that sets itself against the true knowledge of God, which of course is in the word of God. And you and I are to take captive all of these things as we destroy those fortresses to the obedience of Christ. Sounds like to me we have a direct divine commandment to be on the offense, not to be offensive, but to be on the offense as we do these things. Therefore, our thinking in every area of our life should be biblical. As we look at life, we should look at it through the lens of the word of God, his principles, his precepts, his commandments, amen? And the reason is because God's word is true in everything it says. No other religious book on the planet can make these claims of fulfilled prophecy, of confirmed science, of being 100% historically accurate. No other book but God's magnificent word. It's because it's God breathed. That's what inspired by God means. He exhaled it into the various writers of scripture, which makes it authoritative from the very first to the very last verse makes it inerrant. There are no errors. It makes it infallible. It never fails. It is our standard of truth. So there are five points that Pastor Tony Evans makes in his book, Oneness Embrace, on why we need a biblical basis for our worldview. And then we just need to look at these very briefly as we set the stage of how we're moving forward. Number one is the Bible is in the word of God. We've already said that because it's an arid infallible and authoritative. It is the only place we can go to receive a totally accurate 
an objective understanding of, watch this now, race. Whites and black alike have used and misused race for their own advantages. Both races have allowed popular opinion, socio-political structures, cultural traditions, and personal preferences to color their views about themselves and as well as others. And during the era of slavery, whites totally overestimated themselves in an attempt to persuade blacks to totally underestimate themselves. On the other hand, during the 60s, revolutionary black pride was something taken, sometimes taken to violent extremes. The Bible does not suffer from such human lopsidedness because its author is God and God gives the real deal on who we are, what we are, and how we got to be this way. Point number two, the Bible is a multiracial book. Rooting racial history and culture in the Bible allows you and I to contradict Blacks who sometimes write off the Bible as a white man's book and Christianity as a white man's religion. When a person understands the glorious presence of African or Hamitic people in God's drama of redemptive history, scripture is clearly the primary resource for legitimate Black pride. And those who reject the Bible, they stand on shaky racial ground. The scriptures allow Blacks to take pride in who we are and what God has made us without feeling we have to become something other than what God created us to be. Point number three, the Bible gives God's perspective of racial prejudice because race has played such a major role in the social development and the functioning of American society. It's gonna benefit you and I to discover God's perspective on racial prejudice. Let me give you an example. Moses faced racial prejudice when his sister Miriam and brother Aaron challenged his God-given leadership because he was married to an African woman, a Cushite, Numbers 12 and one. What apparently bothered them was not simply that Moses' new bride was dark-complexioned, because it has been proven that other Israelites were also dark skinned. Tuck this away in your memory. Shem, Ham's brother. Shem means dusky. Shem means dusky. Rather, it was that she was black and foreign. Her African ethnic origin was unacceptable to them. It's important to know here that God punished Miriam with the disease of leprosy for her rebellion against Moses. Watch this, because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. That's straight up word, y'all. God turned Miriam's skin white, causing her to be leprous as white as snow, Numbers 12, 10. Racism, whether based on skin color or ethnicity, has always been a terrible sin in the eyes of God and worthy of his severest judgment. Both white and black people who allow race to determine social and political structures in America need to remember that. Number four, the Bible gives us an eternal perspective. A study of race rooted in the Bible links the pride and understanding of race with an eternal purpose, thereby expanding our understanding of, watch this now, missiology. It's clear from scripture that black people are objects of God's love and grace. The very lineage of Jesus included blacks and Africans were among the leaders of the first century church. We'll see that in a short bit. Thus, African-Americans and white Americans can see that black people are an integral part of God's redemptive agenda and have played a decisive role in disseminating that kingdom agenda to the rest of the world. All Christians need to understand the eternal dimensions of black history. Lastly, number five, the Bible is our common ground. It is the guidebook that links black and white Christians to God's eternal truth. Therefore, we should look to it for an understanding of race relations. Just as we read it to know how to make our everyday decisions. The Bible is the primary source for legitimate white and black racial pride, self-authentication, self-analysis, intercultural and cross-cultural analysis, and determining God's view of a group's national purpose. The Bible alone 
fulfills his function with honesty and integrity and should be the starting point for any group to find out his true identity. A biblical perspective is crucial if black people are going to relate properly to their roots and if white people are going to better understand and see us for who we are. Most black churches celebrate Black History Month, but the focus is usually on black American history because there is very little awareness or appreciation for black biblical history. However, part of the process of discipleship within the black church, as well as the white church, needs to be to equip our congregations by providing biblical, historically accurate narratives that accurately reflect the contribution of all of God's tribes, tongues, nations, and people groups. Without it, African Americans are asked to define ourselves with a warped view of our place in history. Anytime people have an incomplete and inaccurate view of themselves, it affects their actions, thus perpetuating many preconceived notions of perception and identification. In the section that follows, we're going to be looking to the Bible, to the Word of God, for a more accurate perspective of Blacks in biblical history. So let's get started at the beginning. One blood, find yourself, free yourself. Let me ask you a question, and you can unmute yourself to answer, to answer this. How many races are there? Quickly, tell me. What say ye? How many races are there? One. Okay. Anybody else? One. Okay. We got another one. Anybody else? I agree. With you. Some people might say two or three. Okay. I say one. Okay. All right. The word of God is very definitive on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You can go, you can mute yourself back up again. Let's take a look at this clip. Because the word of God is definitive. You know, by the way, you are correct. There is only one race. And let's find out why. I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 17.26, where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then their children had children, and those children had children, and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6, 9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark, and according to Genesis 9, 19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Oh, wait a second. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11 and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, so we've got lots of people who were descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. So, let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. 
Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together, they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, and thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. Here's the bigger point though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which by the way, represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A, little a, capital B, little b, the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation. So. Since Adam and Eve were the first people ever, it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see. Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel, he dispersed the population, thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. So the biblical view is quite simple. Adam and Eve. Uh, awesome. Not, yeah. I, can, I like to jump in. I'm, I'm sorry. I just couldn't. I just couldn't uh, not jump in. I, I think that was great. <laughs> Why? Thank you. The biblical view is quite simple. Adam and Eve, besides Cain, Abel, and Seth, and we know Cain slew Abel, had a bunch of other kids, and that's in Genesis 5:4. The idiomatic phrase used in the Hebrew there is that they had a troop. Now, we don't know all their names. We don't know how many, but they had a bunch. So we get out about 1,656 years later, and Noah, he has his son, Shem, Ham, Japheth, okay? Those eight people, because they all have wives, get on board the ark. And that ark of safety takes them through 371 days of the worldwide catastrophic flood. And then they get out, and God tells them, disperse, spread yourself over the earth, the newly remade earth, but they disobey. We'll get to that in just a moment. So you've got almost 150, 200 years between the time they leave the ark till the time of their dispersion. And that's why we have different people, groups, and cultures. So the question I always ask my students, whether they're college, high school, middle school, or elementary school, based on the clip you just saw, based upon the science of genetics. What color was Adam and Eve's skin? What say ye? They had to be middle brown. Middle brown is it. That nails it exactly. Middle brown would be it. Let's look at the science for just a moment. Capital A and B, lots of melanin. Small A and B, small amounts of melanin. When you have those various combinations, large A and Bs, small A and Bs, you're only gonna get one particular type of pigmentation as opposed to middle brown when you've got a combination of both. If Adam and Eve only had little A and little B, they can only produce kids that would look like that. If Adam and Eve only had capital A and capital B, they could only produce kids like that. In either case, they would be lacking genetic variation. But because God would have put into them capital A, small a, capital B, small b, they're able to produce kids across a rainbow course of pigmentation like this and or like this. Because we have that type of genetic variation within us. Okay, or you can produce children that would look like this because of that genetic variation. So God says, all from one blood, he made all of mankind. The quote is from Acts 17, 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. It's what we call biblical anthropology, where you have tribes, tongues, nations, and people groups. And that's from Genesis chapter 10, where you have the table of nations. The idea of Caucasian, Negroid, Mongoloid, and Australioid 
are social constructs from the 16th century. Uh, anthropologists who were commissioned by Great Britain, by England, to give justification for the imperialism of Great Britain. You remember from your history, make the whole world English or British, and how the sun never sets on the British Empire. Those social constructs have no basis in genetic reality or any type of science. I would remind you what Acts 10, 34 and 35 says. Peter, speaking under unction of the Holy Ghost says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. And if I were preaching in your sanctuary right now, I'd say, everybody say favoritism. He does not show it, but accepts every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Amen. So the narrative of world history continues. Civilizations are being built. In Genesis chapters four and five, the land of Nod and cities being built. And who did Cain marry, oh, by the way? He married his sister or a close cousin, simply because there's nobody else to marry at that time. And you might be going in your mind, ew. That's nasty. No, it's not. This is so very close to creation. The bodies that God gave Adam and Eve are not showing very much genetic corruption yet. Until we get out to the time of Moses and God gives the directive of, you shall not marry a close relation. People are marrying a close relation. Let me ask you a question. This is a rhetorical question. It require an answer. Who did Abram marry? Oh, that's right, he married his half sister. Nobody blinks an eye. Nobody says anything about that. Nobody goes, ooh, okay? And that's on the other side of the flood where genetic corruption has not gotten to the point where if you marry a close relation, your offspring are gonna have genetic defects. It's real simple. A curse is upon Cain. The ground no longer will yield his strength to him. A future and a vagabond he's going to be. And a mark is placed on Cain by God, lest anyone should kill him. Let's be real clear. This mark is not God making people black. It's a mark. The Hebrew word is a mark. And God is the one that put him on it. So for anybody who would espouse to you that. God put a mark on black people, you would ask him, and what makes you say that? And where are you getting that from? And would you please, oh, by the way, show me the scripture that would support that supposition. We have Enoch building a city. We have polygamy in Lamech, sons and animal husbandry, sons and musicians, sons and craftsmen in metallurgy. All the signs and indicators of civilization building. You have animal husbandry. And I should remind you, Leviathans, behemoths, and dragons are loose. Quick spelling here. The term dinosaur is not created until 1841, 1842 by Sir Richard Owen. It means thundering lizard or terrible lizard. Therefore, you would not find the word dinosaur in the word of God. Does that make sense? But you find descriptions of dinosaurs. You can look it up in Job. You can look up in Job 40 and 41, where God gives detailed descriptions of behemoths and leviathans and dragons, oh my. We've already covered that Adam and Eve had a troop, a bunch of kids. It's important for you to note that the long lifespans of the antediluvians as a 25 cent word that simply means before the flood, those who live before the flood. Everybody's living five, six, seven hundred years on average. Adam himself lived to 939. Methuselah lived to 969. That probably means you could be 300 years old, Sister Faison, and you and I would still be having children. Amen. So Enoch walks with the Lord and has a testimony that so pleases God that the Lord says, come on up here and spend some real time and in intimate fellowship with me. So God translates him. Now, what's really important about that is that despite the rapid rise in iniquity and transgression, some men begin to call upon the Lord during the time of Seth. 
Cain's progeny is tracked to the seventh generation. In fact, that word, Hebrew word, tolo, that means generations of Adam. And with Seth, the messianic line is restarted. This is the line God chooses to track from here to Noah, to Abraham, to David, to Christ. The estimated population on, on the planet at that time, when the flood occurs, is in the millions. That's based upon a 1.9% population growth. Notice this, please, and you've got to get this. Enoch did not have a New Testament. He didn't even have the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Ghost. And he didn't have, obviously, the rest of the Old Testament. Yet he walked, that's with great fellowship with God. Now, if Enoch could do that with so little, and we have it all, what's our excuse? Why are we not walking in great fellowship with our God in these latter days, in these dark times? That's a question you need to ask yourself as we go forward. So we get out to Genesis chapter six and we got to ask the question, well, what happened? Now God says he was going to destroy all flesh off the face of the earth, what you might call a divine reset. The imagination of the hearts of mankind were continually evil and violence filled the earth. Let me give you an idea very quickly what that imagination piece would look like. People would wake up and in the morning and say to themselves, what iniquity, perversion, transgression can I do today that will outdo the iniquity, perversion, and transgression I did yesterday? That's evil hearts, dark hearts. And God says, I have enough. I'm going to wipe them out. So I want you to notice that in the scriptures, in chapters six and seven, God brings the animals to Noah. Noah didn't have to go get them. God himself shuts Noah, his family, and the creatures, including dinosaurs, into the ark. God says he's gonna destroy all flesh off the face of the earth. I've seen some commentators estimate the population might have been 195 million people. Still based on 1.9% population growth over 1,656 years. You get a lot of people, everybody living as long as they were, able to produce even into what we would consider older age. As I said, God brings the animals to Noah, seven pairs of the clean, one pair of the unclean. And it's an important point that God shuts Noah and his family in. Do you not know Noah had family and friends that were outside the ark who scoffed and mocked at him about? building this large ocean going vessel, but he still cared about them. Imagine if he was the one that had to close the door and seal their doom. Well, God took that weight off of him and he closed it himself. Let's take a look at this very quick clip from Answers in Genesis that depicts what we're talking about. <laughs>
lucky man. That's an accurate depiction of what the flood would have been like with the fountains of the great deep bursting open, jetting up supersonically, maybe 20, 25 miles and producing tremendous dumps of precipitation, which are going to also turn into the ice age. This next clip is a clip from Hollywood, but there is one aspect of it that I'd like you to pay attention to. One line that's near and dear to my heart. See if you can pick it out. going to destroy the world. My father said that one day, if man continued in his ways, the creator would annihilate this world. It will not be averted. He speaks to you. You must trust that he speaks in a way that you can understand. I saw water. Death by water. That's on your life. A great flood is coming. We build a vessel to survive the storm. We build an ark. Mama! What is it? Oh, them! What do you want? You don't know your king. There isn't anything for you here. I have men at my back. And you stand alone and defy me. I'm not alone. desperate and there will be many. Take the ark! I see how hard this was for you. Remember Noah, he chose you for a reason. Is this the end of everything? The beginning. just so we can save time was I am not alone. Amen. And I cannot begin to tell you how that resonates with me. Wow, that was good. And it, it can resonate with you that no, whether you're outnumbered, outpowered, or out anything, if God is with you and you're born again, you are never, ever alone. The world at that time was a one supercontinent. It was also called Rodinia, the world that perished. It goes through some transition phases during the 371 days of the flood. As waters build up and they assuage, you go from initial breakup to Pangaea to a transitional period. And you have today's world. It is estimated by creation scientists that the continental drift was about 45 feet per second as that Middle Atlantic Ridge burst open with the fountains of the Great Deep. So you have the Ark. The Ark is longer than a football field. It's over 510 feet long. It's over five stories high and eight stories wide. It is the basis for all modern going ocean vessels. The dimensions and their proportions are used today. The same type of proportions, okay? And you've got three different levels on the inside. You've got sophisticated ventilation systems, waste disposal, food storage, etc. In fact, you can go to Kentucky as part of Answers in Genesis and see this entire arc 
in its splendor. I suggest you do just that, okay? And the Lord would have brought on board for Noah baby or juvenile dinosaurs, leviathans, behemoths, and dragons. This is what it would have looked like on the worldwide catastrophic floodwaters of Noah's day. So, life after the flood, Genesis 10 and 11. The duration of the flood was 371 days. The entire planet has been changed. It's climate, it's topography, it's geology, it's environment. All of it has been rearranged. God's explicit instructions to Noah's family and their descendants was to spread out upon the earth. The ice age is gonna last about 700 years during this time period. But we find rebellion raising its ugly head once again, and we find the world in revolt. After the flood, Noah and his family gave thanks and offered sacrifices to God for preserving them. God told Noah to go and multiply and fill the earth. Noah's family flourished and multiplied, but they did not spread all over the earth. Instead, they moved down from the mountains of Ararat and settled in the plain of Shinar and dreamed of building a great city. <coughs> Come, let us build a city and a tower to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, looked down upon them and saw the city and the tower they were building. They are united and speak the same language. Now nothing they imagine to do will be impossible for them. So God went down and confused their language so they could not understand each other. And God scattered them over the face of the earth and they stopped building the city. They left Babel by foot, by cart, and by boat. Because of the language barriers, each family group became isolated and developed distinct physical traits and cultures. But all came from the three sons of Noah, so they all share the same genes and all share the same promise of the Savior, the seed which God promised to Adam in the Garden of Eden. time they get off the boat until the time of the dispersion of the ziggurat of Babel. It's about 150, maximum 200 years. Also, also, it should be mentioned that Ham, Shem, Japheth all have kids. Their kids have kids. Therefore, their gene pool is mixed together. That's why in the narrative of the clip, it said they all shared genes. That's very important. This is what the Tower of Babel would have looked like. It does not look like that skyscraper swirl that you're so used to seeing. It's a ziggurat, which means it had a worship center on the top. Think of a pyramid that's cut off at the top and a worship center there, where they might worship the dark arts or the queen of heaven. It is not, and I repeat, it is not this. This is a painting that has been represented as the tower since 1865. It was done, it's called The Confusion of Tongues by Gustave Dore. And it's based upon the minaret of Samara, which is in modern day Iraq. This is a painting. It does not represent the reality of a ziggurat in Mesopotamia. God would have dispersed them all over the world. But here's what's important. When you look at 
the genealogy of the sons of Noah in the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10 for both Japheth and Ham and Shem. Remember, Shem means dusky. Okay, you see their offspring of Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan and Gomer and Magog and Madi and Javan and Tubal and Meshish and Elam and Asher and Aphrodite and Lud and Aram and the further descendants of them. Please notice under Canaan, the Sinites. For those of you who are old enough to remember during the Cold War era between America and the Soviet Union, there was also a secondary Cold War between Russia and China. They had some different philosophies concerning communism. It was known as the Sino-Soviet Cold War, the Sinites under Canaan. There is no curse on Ham. I cannot emphasize this enough. When we looked at Genesis 9.25, Noah had become a farmer and he had planted a vineyard. Unfortunately, Noah got drunk. Ham went into his father's tent and he saw his father's nakedness. And he went and told his brothers who came into Noah's tent and covered him up. Noah placed a curse on Canaan, not Ham, because of this incident of disrespect. It should be noted that the maximum extent of those type of curses usually go to the third or fourth generation. They are not in perpetuity. In other words, they don't last forever, okay? So number one, the whole nation of Ham is not cursed, just one son. It doesn't apply to you and I as descendants of Ham today, okay? And we need to be abundantly clear. So when somebody attempts to make that claim, you ask them, and what makes you say that? And then you ask them to read the scripture back to themselves so they would know, amen? Ham's grandson Nimrod becomes the first empire builder after the flood. See the table of nations. Nimrod is the founder of the great Babylonian Nineveh and Akkadian civilizations. That word Akkadian should be familiar for you movie fans who like the rock. You know, the Scorpion King and him playing various Akkadian assassins and so forth. Mizraim and Put found Egypt. And we'll see in just a few, four, I'm sorry, just a few moments, four times in scripture, Egypt is called the land of Ham. Ham is also spelled cam or cam. Literal means a passionate, hot, burnt, or dark. Please note, he's the progenitor of a lot of people groups that are spread across this world. Cush be one of his sons. Cushites, Nubians, Ethiopians, Ghanaians, Africans, Bushmen, Pygmies, Australian, Aborigines, New Guineans, other related groups. Mizraim which means double straights. I'm sorry, Kush did mean black. Okay, the Kemets, Put, Libya, Cyrenians, Tunisians, Berbers, Somalians, Sudanese, North African, other related groups. Canaan, <coughs> down low. Notice under Canaan, as we look halfway down, Mongols, Asians, Orientals, Chinese, Tibetans, Taiwanese, Thais, Vietnamese, Laotians, Cambodians, Japanese, Eskimos, American Indians, Malaysians, Indonesians, Filipinos, Hawaiians, Maori. Maori, in case you didn't recognize that, those are the native indigenous people of New Zealand. Polynesians, Tahitians, Guatemalans, Samoans, Fijians, Tongans. And if I were to ask you who's the most famous Tongan you know, the obvious answer would be Vi Sikahema, former pro football player, 25 years on. CBS, uh, WCAU here in Philadelphia, recently retired. And oh, by the way, that would be Bishop Sikahemo in the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. Yes, he's a bishop in the Mormon church. Pacific Islanders and the rest find or birth from the descendants of Canaan, Cush, Mizraim, and Put. <clears throat> I have a dear friend who he and his wife traveled to China 
in some of these drawings and sculptures they saw with their own eyes in Chinese museums. Remember, I just got finished telling you the descendants of Ham looks black to me in both sculpture and paintings and otherwise. But this next clip will put the crowning touch on it. However, there is something that could settle this debate of where the Chinese come from once and for all. I'm meeting Professor Jin Li, one of China's leading geneticists. Recently, he led a project that set out to prove that the Chinese evolved independently from everyone else, from Homo erectus, here in China. Before the project started, I was hoping that I could identify or could be able to find the evidence that support independent origin of Chinese in China, because I'm a Chinese and came from China, and through the education process, I always believed that they, there was something special about Chinese. He singled out a male genetic marker, which only appeared about 80,000 years ago in Africa. So any man who carries that marker must have recent African ancestors and can't be descended from the more ancient Asian Homo erectus. Jin took DNA from over 160 ethnic groups around East Asia. Over 12,000 samples. And so, what did you find? We did not see any, even one single individual that were, could be considered as the descendant of the Homo erectus in China. Rather, everybody was a descendant of our ancestors from Africa. The result couldn't have been any clearer. How did that make you feel as a Chinese person? After I saw the evidences that we generate in my laboratory, I think we should all be happy with that because, after all, modern humans from different parts of, part of the world are not so different from each other, and we are very close relatives. It's great, thank you. So the bigger they beat, the blacker it gets, right? There's a 0.2% difference between genetically between any human being on the planet. Remember, Ham, Shem, and JPF are brothers. That distinctly makes you my cousin. It makes anybody from Korea or Japan my cousin. It makes anybody from Germany, Gaul, which is really France, Spain, the steppes of Mongolia. Russia, Rus, they're all my cousins. You see, once you have an understanding, it just takes the sting and the power out of racial prejudice and bigotry. I don't know any of you that would be hating on your cousins. Really? I don't think so. Well, if you've got some prejudice up in you, you need to repent and drop it right now because you're talking about folks that are your cousins. And don't give me that, well, they're not acting like it. You answer to the Lord. They'll answer to the Lord for their racial bigotry and prejudice. You be right in your attitude, amen? So now that you've actually seen what we've already declared about lineage, when you look to Central and South America, you find statues and paintings and carvings. Those guys look black to me. or Hamite to me. So looking at the history, whichever region is considered, Africa, Europe, Australia, or America, the major migrations have always been from Asia slash Asia Minor. And that would include Mesopotamia. In every area of the world where Japanthites have subsequently settled, they've always been preceded by Hamites. That's what the archaeological evidence shows. This pattern applies on every continent. In early Historic times, the circumstances seem always to be true. The earliest fossil remains of man being Hamitic in character and in head shape, whereas those that came last belong to the family of Japheth. When we study ancient history and techno technological achievements, which were in many ways the equal of or superior of much that we have today, we find Hamitic 
people showed an amazing adaptability to the world in which they found it and carried to a high technological proficiency their society. The ancient name of Africa, which is really a Greek name for the continent, is Alkabulon. Alkabulon. A L K E B U L A N. Mitzrayim is the ancient name of Egypt. Sometimes people call it Kemet. Still used today that Mitzrayim or Miz as a modern official name. For those of you who may have been missionaries and you spent time in Egypt, you know this to be true. They have financial and social institutions that are named after their founder, Mizraim. Psalm 7851, and destroyed all the firstborn of Egypt, the first of their strength in the tents of Ham. Psalm 10523, Israel also came into Egypt and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. Psalm 105.27, they performed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. Psalm 106.22, wondrous works in the land of Ham, awesome things by the Red Sea. Are you convinced now that Egypt, according to the word of God, God's inerrant, infallible word, is the land of Ham? The early dioceses and kingdoms were solely Hamitic. The science of mathematics, astronomy, built a pyramid, I'm sorry, pyramid building, Hamite. The Hiscos invasion does not occur until the mid 16th century BC. You're probably asking yourself, well, who are the Hyksos? They're from the, what you might call the Palestinian region, region of Canaan. They came down, they did their conquering thing, but it didn't last all that long, maybe two, 300 years. And then the Egyptians retook their kingdom. I should also mention the Nubian kings also ruled in Egypt. That's a different branch of your Hamite tree. All right. Ask yourself a very simple question about that high technology. I'm a little tired of hearing, well, you know, the technology was so far advanced, they must have had aliens come down and give it to them. You need to stop that nonsense right now. Early civilizations were brilliant and endowed by God with a towering intellect. Let me ask you a very simple question. You still see the paintings from Egypt and the early dynasties on their walls, literature, other things. How is it that I can't get Sears weather beater the last eight years, but their stuff has lasted 4,000? Oh, I guess they knew how to make better paint. We're not even gonna get into the architecture and the other scientific things that they did. So you've got a heritage of scientists, engineers, explorers, architects, artists, kingdom builders. You have Mizraim for Egypt, Nimrod in the land of Shinar, which to establish Assyria, Nineveh, Rehoboth Beach, I'm sorry, Rehoboth Ur, Kala and Resin, Kush for Ethiopia, put Libya. You have all the ites, who I like all God's little ites, Half for the Hittites, Hivites, the original inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Jebusites. I want you to take notice here that Asenef, daughter of the priest of On, a Hamite, an Egyptian. And who did she marry? Joseph, a Semite, a dusky person. Who did they have as offspring? Manasseh and Ephraim. That should settle your any controversy about so-called black tribes of the 12 of Israel. Right here, Manasseh and Ephraim. Of course, you know from your Bible study, Ephraim is the greater of the two. Akmos is the Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. Ebit Melech saved Jeremiah and survived the Babylonian siege. We're going to mention Rahab, Boaz, Ruth, David, and Solomon in just a few moments, along with Simon the Canaanite. Simeon. It's called Niger and Lucius the Cyrene, the eunuch and Queen Candace. Hold on to your hats. Here we go. These are more details from Pastor Tony Evans' book, One is Embraced. Watch this. We're looking at influential blacks in the Bible in just a little bit more detail. We've already covered the sons of Han, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Cush being the progenitor of the Ethiopian people. This is validated by the fact that the names Cush and Ethiopia are used interchangeably 
in the scripture, Genesis 2, 13, 10, 6. Mizraim was the progenitor of the Egyptian people who are understood in scripture who had been a Hermetic people and thus African. We just did those scriptures. Put, progenitor of Libya, and Canaan was the progenitor of the Canaanites. Excuse me. One of the most problematic foes of God's chosen people, the Israelites. Nimrod of particular importance is the powerful Old Testament figure. Nimrod, the descendant of Cush, ruled in the land of Shinar, Genesis 10, 8 through 10 and 11, 2. Nimrod eventually became the father of two of the greatest empires in the Bible and in world history, Assyria and Babylonia. He was the first great leader of a world civilization. He led all the people of the earth at that time and served as earth's protector. You remember Nimrod, a great hunter before the Lord. Nimrod's presence and accomplishments confirmed the unique and early leadership role black or Hamitic people played in world history. The tribe of Ephraim. Hamitic people were crucial to the program of God throughout the Old Testament biblical history. Joseph's wife, an Egyptian woman, that's in there, Genesis 41 and 45, 50 through 52, was the mother of Manasseh and Ephraim, who later became leaders of Jewish tribes. In fact, the tribe of Ephraim produced one of the greatest leaders Israel ever had, Moses' successor. We're talking about Joshua. Numbers 13 and 8, First Chronicles. 722 through 27. This Jewish African link is very strong in scripture. The prophet Amos said, Are you not as the sons of Ethiopia to me, O sons of Israel? declares the Lord in Amos 9 7. Caleb was the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and the Kenizzites were part of the Canaanite tribes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Genesis 15 and 19, and descendants of Ham. Caleb also came from the tribe of Judah, Joshua 14, 6 and 14. Judah, the progenitor of the tribe, fathered twin sons, watch this, by Tamar, a Hamitic woman, Genesis 38. Caleb joined with Joshua as one of the two spies who went to explore Canaan and brought back a positive report to enter the land and take possession of it as God had declared, Numbers 13 and 14. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, from whom Moses received the greatest single piece of advice regarding national leadership, ministry organization, political strategy, and personal planning. That's Exodus 18, 13 through 27. It's ever been recorded. Was a Kenite, Judges 1, 16. Part of the Canaanite tribe, Genesis 15, 19 who descended from Ham. At that time, the Kenites had settled in the land of Midian. Another interesting observation regarding Jephthah, you gotta watch this now, is that he's identified as the priest of Midian, Exodus 3.1. Since he was a priest, yet he was not a, a Levite in the Aaronic priesthood, had not yet been established. The question is, well, what kind of priesthood could this have been? The only other priesthood within the framework of scripture to which Jethro could have belonged was the priesthood of Melchizedek, Genesis 14, 18. This is significant because Christ was a priest after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 7, 17 and other scriptures. This means that the priest Jethro who was of African descent may have been indicative of pre aaronic priesthood, such as that of Melchizedek, and which foreshadowed the priestly role of both Christ and the church. This then is another basis for recognizing the strategic role Africans, Hamites, played in the biblical saga that continues today. Because all Christians are related to Jephro and his priesthood as part of the royal priesthood. First Peter 2 9, you're called a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. King David is known not only as a man after God's own heart, 1 Samuel 13, 14, but as one of the greatest kings in Israel's history. David's great-grandmother was a Canaanite woman, Rahab, who's also listed in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews eleven thirty one. 31. David's grandmother was Ruth, a Moabite, from a people who were Canaanites as well. 
David, one of the heroes of the faith, hailed from mixed Jewish and Hamitic ancestry and stands as a leader of whom Blacks can be proud to call our own. Solomon was David's son with Bathsheba, a Hamitic woman. Bathsheba literally means the daughter of Sheba. The table of nations identifies Sheba in the line of Ham, making Sheba a descendant from an African nation. Genesis 10, 7. The Song of Solomon describes Solomon with features that are tanned and handsome. Better than 10,000 others, his head is pure as gold. And he has wavy raven hair. Song of Solomon, 510 through 11, the Living Bible. Solomon was not only the wisest man to rule a nation, but he also brought about the greatest expansion of Israel's reach as a kingdom. You can read that in 1 Kings 3, 3 through 14. Solomon's great, great grandmother and mother gave him roots within the Hamite black race and place them as an example of black achievement. The prophet Zephaniah underscores the fact that black people are an integral part of God's revelatory process in both the proclamation and recording of divine revelation. The Old Testament states that Zephaniah was of Hamitic origin. He was from the lineage of Cush, Zephaniah 1.1. And he was the great grandson of King Hezekiah. Oh my. He prophesied God's judgment on Judah and her enemies for their rebellion against God and their gross idolatry. Yet, being the oracle of God, he proclaimed the grace of God would save a remnant and restore blessings to the people. People of African descent can take pride in God's prophet Zephaniah, one of the biblical offers as their forefather. Find yourself, free yourself. Matthew 2.13 says this. When they had gone, an angel, that the they be the three wise men in their caravans. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Well, it's really quite simple. You don't hide out in a place where you don't blend in. Hmm. Egypt is the land of Ham, is it not? Hmm, okay, just saying. Even the great apostle Paul was mistaken for being an Egyptian. Am I? Art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days, made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers. But Paul said, I'm a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. You need to understand, at this particular time in biblical history, people from Shem and Ham retain their pigmentation. The Ashkenazi who came out of Europe after their diaspora are much, much, much fairer than their ancient ancestors. So you be. Or the establishment or expansion of the Coptic Church in Africa revealed the high degree of organizational and administrative responsibility that existed within the upper echelons of Ethiopian culture. The Bible describes him as a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. That would be Acts 8.27. According to the standard Greek lexical studies, the word Ethiopian is of Greek origin. It literally means burnt face. The term eunuch does not necessarily denote emasculation. You need to get that. It can refer to high military and political figures. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. Oh, excuse me. The scriptural account of the Ethiopian official is significant for two reasons. First, it acknowledges the existence of a kingdom of dark-skinned peoples at the time of first century Christianity. Second, 
It records the continuation of Christianity in Africa after having been initiated through the first African Jewish proselytes who were con converts at Pentecost, Acts 2.10. This account of Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian official verifies God's promise in Zephaniah. Write it down. Zephaniah 3, 9 through 10. For then I will give to the people's purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him, watch this, shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones will bring my offerings. These verses show God's desire. He wishes to call to himself peoples from the African continent not into servitude and disdain as some incorrectly surmise, but into brotherhood with all men, all men to serve him, shoulder to shoulder. And if I was preaching, I would say, can I get an amen? Two immediately come to mind, Simon of Cyrene and Lucius. Simon who helped Jesus carry his cross was of African descent, as we know because Cyrene is a country of North Africa. Matthew 27, 32. The church at Antioch had two black men as leaders. Simeon, who was called Niger or black, as I mentioned earlier, and Lucius, who was from Cyrene. These two men assisted in the ordination and commissioning of the apostle Paul. This verifies that black people were not only leaders in the culture of the New Testament era, but also leaders in the church itself. Let's consider Hamites black in the lineage of Christ. Deserving of our greatest attention, of course, is his lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he's the heart and soul of the Christian faith. Over and over again, the prophets prophesied that the Messiah would come from the seed of David. As, as we have already seen, the Davidic line finds a number of Black people within it. Of the five women mentioned in Matthew's genealogy, Matthew 1, 1 through 16, four of are of Hamitic descent, Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, and Ruth. The point here is not that Jesus was black. And I need to really make this a very important point. To assert such as some black theologians and religious leaders do is to fall into the exclusionist perspective of many whites. It's just the opposite. Who would make Jesus an Anglo-European, blue-eyed blonde who had very little reverence to people of color? It would also fail to respect the distinct Jewish heritage of Christ. Rather, Jesus is what could be called a mestizo. That's a Spanish term. It all it really means is a mixed parentage or mixed lineage, a mixed ancestry. They used it for a different reason when they made up the word. But the important thing is it just denotes a mixed ancestry. It blesses me to know that Jesus had black in his blood because this destroys any perception of black inferiority once and for all. In Christ, we find perfect man and sinless savior. This knowledge frees blacks from any inferiority complex and at the same time, it frees white from the superiority myth. In Christ, we all have our heritage. Black peoples, uh, all other peoples can find a place of historical, cultural, and racial identity in him, and that him is the Lord. <clears throat> As savior of all mankind, he can relate to all people in every situation. In him, any person from any background can find comfort, understanding, direction, affinity, as long as he is revered as the son of God. A designation that transcends every culture, every tribe, tongue, nation, people, group, and one to which all nations and peoples must pay homage. You know, that's the idea, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, the word every right there. Even when we leave the pages of the New Testament era, we run into African people of the faith who had a profound influence upon the expansion of Christianity. The church fathers for centuries anointed men of erudition have sculpted the development of the Christian faith and have postulated ways to articulate the deep and intricate truths of Christian theology. A great disservice has been done to people of African descent and the failure of church historians to the front of our 
the African hermetic descent of many of the most noted church fathers. By looking at the strategic place African people have played in the history and development of the Christian faith, both through their piety and intellectual prowess exercised for the glory of God, we authenticate God's continual activity in the black race. We also encourage Christians of African descent, watch this, to see ourselves as the continuation of a divine legacy. Our opulent heritage should serve to motivate us to continue dispensing God's truth by the means of the talents he's deposited in our community, not only just for the benefit of the black community, but also for the Christian community at large. Now that's true freedom. Augustine, who is by far the most scholarly influential of all the church fathers and is known as the father of theologians, was not only African, but was most probably black. And you wanna know how we know that? His mother, Monica, was a Berber. And Berbers were a group of dark-skinned people belonging to the vicinity of Carthage. Many referred to Augustine as the father of Orthodox theology. The greater majority of his doctrinal opinions have stood the test of time and the scrutiny of many theologians throughout the annals of theological history. And upon observing his life experience through the lens of his confessions, one can see easily his strong view of the grace of God. The thought and contribution of Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, became the theological foundation for the Protestant Reformation as well as contemporary reform Calvinistic theology. What about Athanasius of Alexandria? He was known as the, watch this, black dwarf because of his dark skin and short stature. As a young man, he served as secretary to the Alexander Bishop of, to Alexander, Bishop of Alexandria. Upon the death of Alexander, it was made known to Athanasius that he, made, that he had been chosen by Alexander to succeed him as Bishop of Alexandria. Athanasius was involved in the theological war against the heresy of Arius and the Arians, who taught that Jesus Christ was not truly God, but a lesser creature. It was because of this heresy that the Council of Nicaea met in the year AD 325. Athanasius exhibited a cognitive understanding of theological issues that was far beyond his own time. And we're running up on the end piece right about now. Quintus, Septimius, Florence, Tertullian, who like Augustine lived in Carthage, was another of the great African church fathers. Tertullian received a good education in literature and rhetoric. He was converted to Christianity sometime prior to AD 197. Tertullian's facility for rhetoric and argumentation impacted the religious environment of his day. Among Tertullian's greatest contributions to Christian theology were his thoughts toward the foundation of the Trinitarian formula. In his prescription against the heretics, he argued that the heretics of his day had no right to refute the church and that scriptures were the sole property of the church. While it is unclear as to his precise skin tone, there's more evidence to support that he was black than there is to support that he was white. But I cannot say with complete certainty. Perhaps the greatest evidence is that he lived in North Africa during a time that was dominated by Darcyan people. Kind of makes sense. It should be evident from even a limited understanding of the Bible that many people of African descent have had a major role in the development and dissemination of the Christian faith. Yet, if these biblical characters and church fathers were living in Christian America during the 1940s, they would have had to sit at the back of the bus, use separate restrooms and water fountains, and be discriminated against in the realms of housing, education, and employment. Far from being the uninformed people who were afterthoughts in the mind and plan of God, Blacks were a well-informed, progressive, productive, and influential people. So much so that we were at the very center of every aspect of God's activity in history. It's only because people have failed to present an accurate reflection of historical truth that this reality is ignored. I invite Anglos to see African-Americans through the lens of scripture rather than that of culture. In doing so, there can be a basis of equality in relationship building. If we who are black will see ourselves through the same lens of scripture, 
we will discover an appropriate basis for racial pride in the God of the Bible. It also means we can give other races the same significance and respect as part of God's creation that we deserve to receive from them. Remember, from Acts 10, 34 and 35, when Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Did you get that? Does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Thus, by finding ourselves interwoven through God's redemptive plan in scripture, we free ourselves from all bondages and yokes of sinful oppression. And as Dr. Martin Luther King said, free at last, free at last. Thank God almighty, free at last. That ladies and gentlemen concludes part one of From the Beginning, one